people first organizations will win in the future of work. Your only real asset is your people. We, we all, all want, want purpose driven work. work. HR led organization is. I'm the sorry, but leaders don't lead empty desks and empty shop floors. Welcome to the People Strategy Leaders Show. I'm your host, Sri Chalapa, founder and president of Engagedly, and a serial entrepreneur in technology, films, and music. This is where we talk to people leaders, business strategists, and organizational savants about leading in the time of change. What is working, what is not working, and more importantly, what we should be thinking about. Stick around to the end of the show. We will reveal how you can be our next guest. And now, let's engage. Hello, and this is Sri Chalapa with People Strategy Leaders Podcast. Today, I'm joined with Jacob Morgan. Jacob is the best-selling author of five books, including his most recent, Leading with Vulnerability, Unlock Your Greatest Superpower to Transform Yourself, Your Team, and Your Organization, which is coming out in October and can be found at leadwithvulnerability.com. He's also a speaker and professionally trained futurist whose work has been endorsed by the CEOs of Best Buy, MasterCard, Unilever, KPMG, Nestle, Cisco, and best-selling authors like Adam Grant, Mel Robbins, Patrick Lencioni, and Amy Edmondson. You can also learn more about Jacob at thefutureorganization.com or get access to his content, head to greatleadership.substack.com. Well, welcome to the show, Jacob. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Great. So you have this new book coming out and you've written, I believe, five books at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so tell me a little bit about what this book is about and why now? The book is called Leading with Vulnerability, and it basically looks at um, how to approach vulnerability in the right way, specifically for leaders, so that they are able to tap into it to create trust, to drive business performance, lead through change, um, and unlock the potential of those around them. And I wrote the book because there's been a lot of talk about vulnerability over the past few years. Brene, uh, Brene Brown obviously has written a lot of books on that. She's been pioneering that for over the last decade. But it became very clear after talking to a lot of CEOs and business leaders that vulnerability at work is not the same as it is at home. And if you're a leader, vulnerability for you is not the same as it is for everybody else. So <clears throat> I wanted to write a book that explores how to approach vulnerability in the right way. And what I've come to uh, conclude is that at work, vulnerability can actually cause far more harm than good. Because the if you think about the relationship between an employee and an employer, basically you get hired because you are supposed to have a certain set of skills and capabilities and talents. And the organization hired you to do a job that it needed help with. So if you show up to work every day and you talk about your feelings and your mistakes and challenges and struggles and failures, at a certain point, somebody's going to look at you and say, maybe this isn't a good fit. And it's very clear that vulnerability at work alone can actually hurt you far more than it can help you because it will erode confidence and trust in your abilities. Now, it's not to say that vulnerability alone is bad, but the whole point of the book is to add leadership to the vulnerability. So a simple example is <clears throat> if you show up to work and you're given a project to do and you mess up on the project, instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I messed up, you say, I'm sorry, I messed up. Here's what I learned. Here's what I'm going to do in the future to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again. So vulnerability can be thought of as exposing a gap, um, a gap in understanding, a gap in ability, whatever it might be, a gap in, you know, who knows what. But you're basically yeah. exposing that you're lacking, uh, you're struggling. There's a gap somewhere there. That's vulnerability. In your personal life, that's okay. Because for example, if I talk to my wife, Blake, and I say, you know what, I'm really struggling today. I'm having a bad day. It's a different environment, right? There's no hierarchy. There's no boss or employees or projects or deadlines. There's no issue of money. We don't have customers. At work though, it's different because you do have those elements at play. You do have that dynamic of a team environment, of a hierarchy of boss, employees, money, projects, deadlines, like you're being paid to do something. And so it's it's a very, very different environment. So again, being vulnerable is just exposing, sharing what that gap is. And leading with vulnerability is sharing the gap, but then talking about what you're doing personally to try to close that gap. And that's what we forget inside of organizations. And that's what we don't spend enough time doing is trying to explain how you're trying to close the gap. 
Yeah, I think what you mentioned is a great mm -hmm. difference there, right? Because as a leader, you're being looked at as somebody you have answers from, somebody you can go to for direction um, and vision. And if you've come across as you're unsure because you're struggling with making decisions, you know, obviously that's going to set a bad example for the employee and they might question if this is the right person I should be following. Yes. You know, so I think that's what you're highlighting, which makes this makes a lot of sense. But leading with vulnerability is that, yes, we can make mistakes, but we have to learn from it and move forward. Um, yeah, it's any it's in any kind of situation where you have to talk about a gap, try to demonstrate what you're doing to close the gap. Maybe you're even asking for help. Right? Asking for help is a clear admi admission that you have a gap. You don't know how to do something. So instead of just saying, hey, can you help me with this? You could say, hey, can you help me with this? And in the future, if I need help, um, here's how I'm going to figure out how to solve my own problem. Yeah. So yeah. what are you doing to create progress, to move forward, to become more competent in your role? So what's the relationship, you know, you talked about competence, right? So vulnerability and competence. Yes. Uh, because vulnerability could indicate, you know, accidentally, if you will, incompetence as well. So, but you say there's, a diff there's actually a relationship between the two, which is not the same. So I want to hear more about that. Yes, there is a very direct and important relationship between vulnerability and competence. Um, these two, I mean, that's the foundation of the book, right? don't just be vulnerable and also don't just be competent. You have to bring in both vulnerabilities where connection comes from and leadership is where competence comes from. And I think those are the two most important aspects of any leader. You got to be able to connect with your people and you have to be able to demonstrate that you're good at your job and that you can actually lead people. And so if you're really only good at the competence piece, then you're going to be perceived as a robot. Like if you're just really good at your job, but you're not able to connect with people, then people are just going to think you're kind of like a robot. You're a stereotypical leader. You're not good at motivating and engaging and inspiring people. You just don't have that chemistry. Similarly, <clears throat> if you're only good at vulnerability and you only focus on connection, then people will think you're incompetent. So it's not good to either be viewed as incompetent or to be a robot. So this is why you need to be focusing on both of those things, competence and um, vulnerability. Now, there's a little bit of a catch here because um, there's a concept in psychology called the Pratfall effect, which basically states that if you are good at your job, so you're highly competent at what you do, and then you're vulnerable, you are now perceived as being more likable and more competent. Because if you think about it, let's say I'm really good at my job and I show up to work, and now all of a sudden I share a mistake or a challenge. People are going to look at me and then they're going to say, oh, wow, we thought Jacob was this like perfect leader, but even he makes mistakes. So he's even more likable. He's viewed as even more, more competent. You get a little bit of a boost. However, if you're not good at your job and you show up to work and you're constantly vulnerable, then it reinforces your mediocrity. So if I'm just a C player at work, I'm just kind of, you know, average. And I'm always talking about the mistakes and failures, uh, failures and challenges and struggles then at some point people are going to say, yeah, I get why you're not getting promoted. It makes sense why you're a C player. Right. So the, the trick here, again, there's no substitute for being good at your job. And this is why it always comes back to this idea of the vulnerable leader equation. Leadership plus vulnerability equals leading with vulnerability. You got to have both those things. Yeah. I'm going to introduce one third thing that I, I always talk about, which is confidence, right? Because vulnerability could be looked as the opposite of confidence and we usually in in the workplaces we we mix con confidence with competence but yeah. they're really two different things because confident people get promoted even if they're not competent and vulnerability is almost on paper it looks like it's the opposite of confidence but in reality yes. it is actually confidence because you have confident enough to talk about it so can, can you talk about that in the equation of, of vulnerability and competence? Yeah, so there's a section of the book where I talk about these eight attributes of vulnerable leaders. And you can kind of think of these eight attributes as um, if anybody's ever watched Avengers, uh, you know, they have these infinity stones and you collect the infinity stones, you bring them together, they unlock this tremendous superpower. 
That's how I think of these eight attributes. And one of those eight attributes is actually self-confidence. And self-confidence is exactly that. It is um, belief in yourself. Um, it's having that positive self-talk where you know that you can learn and grow and get better. So it is a aspect of leadership. There are three components out of these eight attributes, three for leadership and five for vulnerability. So the three for leadership are competence, which is being good at your job, um, self-confidence, which is what we just talked about, and then motivation. So the drive to achieve, the drive to do better, the drive to, to do whatever you need to do. Right. So uh, let, going back to vulnerability affecting your um, work, if you will, um, and you, you talked a little bit about that. So what should people do so that it, it's not being used against them? Um, you know, and maybe you're not a leader. You know, if you're a leader, yeah. I guess, you know, that's one thing you, you can use your, your um, hierarchy to stop that. But if you're not a leader, um, what are some other things they should look out for? Well, there's nothing you can do to keep vulnerability from being used against you. In fact, uh, I can promise you that at some point, vulnerability will be used against you. It's just kind of the nature of life, right? I mean, at some point you'll ask for a promotion and you'll be turned down. You'll ask for more money, you'll be turned down. You'll ask somebody out on a date, you'll be turned down and you'll be vulnerable and it'll get used against you. But it's not going to happen nearly as often as you think. It'll happen occasionally. And there's no way to make sure that it never happens. In fact, um, I think I think it was around 75% of the 14,000 employees that we surveyed said that they've had vulnerability used against them at least one point in their career. I did an informal poll on LinkedIn, uh, a thousand people, and 80% of them said that they had vulnerability used against them at some point in their careers. So it will happen at some point. The goal isn't to avoid it because it'll happen, right? I mean, if you ask for a promotion and somebody tells you tells you no, are you never going to ask for another promotion again? Right. Or if you go out and you try to ask somebody out on a date and they tell you no, is that it? Are you done with dating for the rest of your life? No. Uh, same thing with vulnerability. If it gets used against you, you have a couple of choices. Obviously, one choice you can make is you could say, well, that didn't go well. I'm never going to do that again. And that's a the worst thing that you could do. The best thing that you can do is to take a step back and say, well, it was used against me. What did I learn about myself and about the situation and about the other person that I can apply in the future so that when those situations happen again, I can do things a little bit differently so maybe this doesn't have uh, have a high chance of happening. That's the right approach. You turn it into a learning moment. Um, yeah. But if people think that there's just a bulletproof way to avoid it from being used against them, there's just, there's no way. Yeah. So looking at the world today, if you look at the leaders today in the workplace, and you talk to a lot of CEOs and leaders out there, um, where, where, where can you find some really good examples of people who've done this really well, where they're leading with vulnerability without necessarily being too vulnerable, where, you know, it's, it's, they're perceived as weak leaders? Well, and it's interesting that you mentioned too vulnerable. So you can be too anything. You can be too vulnerable. You can be too empathetic. You can be too anything for that matter. Right. Um, usually that happens because people lack the intention. In other words, they don't know why they're doing or sharing what they're doing or sharing. And when you don't have the intention, then you just talk and you share everything and anything with everybody. So the intention is important. So you always have to take a step back and say, well, why, why do I want to share this? Why do I want to do this? What is the reason, uh, the, the, rationale, the rationale, the reasoning behind it? If you can't answer that, you should probably stop and not right. do whatever it is that you want to say or do. Um, so you're quite, oh, So what, what was your original question again? I'm saying where, you know, you talked to a lot of CEOs and leaders. Uh, some examples. Some examples of where you've seen that people done really well. Mm. Uh, and I want to do a follow-up question to that, but I would like to hear the examples. There are a few that I talk about in the book. Um, Barbara Humpton is the CEO of Siemens. Um, she shared a really great story with me about how when she was put into a position of leadership at Lockheed Martin, and she walked into the room and everybody kind of was looking at her like, who the hell is this person? What is she doing here? And she was very vulnerable in that situation by... Um, admitting 
that she was new to the role, admitting that maybe she didn't have the experience that everybody else has. So she was vulnerable there. But then she added the leadership piece and she demonstrated what she's going to do to get that experience. And so she met with a lot of employees one-on-one. -on -one. She spent a lot of time going through education and training. So she exposed that she had that gap, but she also demonstrated and committed to everybody what she was trying to do to close that gap so that people could look at her and say, okay, that's fair enough. Another example is Fleetwood Grobler. So I tell two stories in the book. One um, that, that kind of go together. One is Hollis Harris. He's the former CEO of Continental Airlines. And when he took over as CEO, the airline was struggling. It was going through a tough time. And he sent out a memo to his employees that basically said, the company's going through a tough time. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. Pray for the future of the company. And the next day he was fired. And I also interviewed um, a CEO, again, named Fleetwood Grobler, CEO of a South African energy company called Sassel. Around 30,000 employees, when he took over as CEO, he too was put into a very difficult spot. Uh, $13 billion in debt, as I mentioned, the company was about to be repossessed by the banks. He also had to give a memo to his employees. And he started off with vulnerability. The company's in a tough time. I'm not sure about what the economy is going to bring. I don't know the exact path that we need to take forward to get things turned around. And then he had a leadership. I have a vision of where I think our business can go. I trust our employees and I know that we can rebuild, um, rebuild confidence in our customers and in our people. If you come with me on this journey, I know that we'll be able to turn the business around and become successful. He added the leadership piece. And that's exactly what they did. They turned around the company and they became uh, successful. Um, so those are a couple examples. There's many, many more in the book. But um, in all those situations, when vulnerability is present, try whenever possible to add the leadership piece. Right. You know, one, I don't know if this is something that's been explored in the different research studies. Or, uh, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I love data. Uh, but one, is there any data around the performance of companies where com people lead with vulnerability? Or is there even a way to measure that in the first place? Yeah, we looked at it a few different areas. We looked at, um, so in organizations where leaders um, always or often display vulnerability when appropriate, those organizations, the leaders there have a much higher perception of being high quality leaders. Um, so there's a perception of higher quality leaders. Um, engagement in those organizations is nearly three times as high. Those organizations are more than twice as likely to drive innovation. Those companies are better at creating inclusive environments. Those companies are better at managing a remote workforce. Those companies are better dealing and navigating ambiguous and uncertain, um, un uncertain circumstances and situations. So from that perspective, there is a lot of value there in terms of why leading with vulnerability is important from a business perspective. So the second question was, is there a way to actually measure this? Or if I am a leader, how do I know if I'm leading with vulnerability or not? How can I even do a self-assessment on that? I think there are a couple of things that you can do. One, of course, you can always ask your people. You can say, hey, I'm reading this book called Leading with Vulnerability. Um, and it teaches me about these two things of competence and connection. So you can always ask and have a conversation with people. Um, you don't need, uh, and I thought about when I was writing this book, do I need to create some kind of a formal assessment here? Mm -hmm. And I, I came to the conclusion that you don't. This is one of those things where your people can give you good feedback and you should be able to almost in a way assess yourself. So the leadership piece, I think, is pretty clear. Like, are you good at your job by all subjective and objective metrics? Like, do people look at you and say you're good at your job? Like, that's pretty standard. Um, and do people look at you and say that you're able to connect with them? And we have a lot of different measures and metrics we use for that. We have employee engagement surveys. We have reviews of managers and things of that nature. But honestly, I think the best thing that you can do is to look at and ask your employees, how do you perceive me in terms of my role just as a, as, as a leader? Am I good at my job? Do you feel like I'm able to connect with you on a human level? I think if you can just ask those two very basic questions, that'll give you a good sense of if you're able to lead with vulnerability. You don't need some crazy like 20 question, 30 question quiz. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's, that's true. And maybe there's a way to ask that. And if you're doing it at scale, maybe there's a way to ask that in the survey. And that might be a good one to do as well. Yeah, I mean, if you really want to break it down, right? I, ha I have these eight attributes of, 
um, vulnerable leaders. So, uh, you know, I, we talked about three of them for leadership. There's five for vulnerability. So it's certainly possible to create an assessment that looks at those eight attributes in total and measure those at scale. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no way to, I guess, do it on your own. You might want to ask other people how they perceive you because it's all about perception at the end of the day. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. You might think you're vulnerable, but that's not what people might think. People might Maybe think we'll use your platform to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we do have a survey tool, so we definitely can do that. So um, who was this book written for? Was it primarily for leaders or is it written for every person in the workforce or is there any specific audience that it's uh, most suited for? Anyone with a job. Anyone who is a current or aspiring leader. Anyone who wants to make a, uh, a bigger impact who wants to create trust to unlock their potential and the potential of their people, anyone who wants to be able to lead through change and drive business performance. And I think that's pretty much everybody in the corporate world. Um, so, you know, there's also a lot of applicable components to this in your personal life, but I think anybody with a job or anybody who wants a job should read the book. Great. Well, thank you, Jacob. It's been a pleasure. I wish you all the best with the new book. I can't wait to get my hands on it. Um, thank you. Yeah, th thank you for having me. People can always go to learn. Uh, they can go to learnwithvulnerability.com. Uh, I'm sorry, leadwithvulnerability.com to learn more about the book. Uh, and there's some cool stuff on there if people order it and send me proof of purchase. Um, and then, like you said, we have the Substack. So I'm sharing some of the research and insights uh, on the Substack community. And that's greatleadership.substack.com. Excellent. And when does this book actually come out? Is there a specific date? Uh, October 3rd. Okay, well, that's coming soon. So excellent. I'm going to pre-order it right now and look forward to reading it. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. It's been a pleasure. Shri Chalapa here. Thank you so much for listening to the People Strategy Leaders Podcast. If you are a successful leader or a people strategist who would like to be on this program, please visit engagedly.com slash people strategy leaders podcast. If you got something out of this interview, would you share this episode on social media? If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag people strategy leaders. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content to make sure you don't miss any episodes. Go ahead and subscribe your thumbs up ratings and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sri Chalapa. Thanks for listening. We will see you next time. And thank you to Patrick Ramsey, sound engineer at Kalinga Production Studios for recording and mixing this show.